This morning we are continuing in, in the Gospel of Mark. If you would turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11. would like to read the first 11 verses that has to do with our Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is basically the day of his presenting himself to Israel as her king. Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 11. Let me read those for you. And as they approached Jerusalem at, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, in which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, What are you doing? Untying the colt. And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. And they brought the colt to Jesus and put their garments on it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments in the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed after were crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, we've, we've heard a lot this morning about the fact that Jesus Christ is king. And um, you know as well as I do that in the United States, we're not exactly used to the idea of a king, although sometimes we look at the president in that way. We do know that the country that was responsible primarily for the founding of America had kings, uh, uh, Great Britain. And we know that many of the nations of Europe have had kings. But we haven't really ever had kings, except when we were a colony, of course. From the very founding of the United States, we have been founded as a republic, I suppose a form of democracy, in which there is rule by the will of the people through elected representatives. But because we haven't had kings, the idea of a sovereign ruler, one who has all authority wrapped up into one person, can seem kind of frightening, especially since so many of the kings that have existed in the history of the world have become tyrannical. The old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And they have abused their subjects for their own good, for their own purposes, for their own advancement. Now, not all kings have done this, but many have. But what about a king like this one, who is a perfect king? A king who would never do anything wrong, but one who loves what is good and one who loves what is right. One who is just and yet is gracious and merciful. One who has the power to provide for you and to protect you. One who, we have to admit, is willing even to lay down his life for you and has, in fact, shown his love already by doing that for you. What about this kind of king? Now, this kind of king doesn't seem so threatening as the others, but really the kind of king and the kind of government that I would hope that you would want, that we would all want, the kind that would be good for you and do good for you. Well, that's the kind of king that you have with Jesus Christ. And basically what we see this morning is the presentation of Jesus Christ as king over his people. Now, we know that Jesus has been traveling for, for some time now, as we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, towards Jerusalem, and now he finally arrives in Jerusalem. And you'll remember that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem for a particular reason. We see that reason unfold as he sends two of his disciples into a neighboring town to find this donkey's colt. And they bring the colt to Jesus, one that has never been ridden on lay their garments on it, and he rides it into Jerusalem. 
as his disciples and the crowd spread their coats and leafy branches in the road, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. I hope you realize what all of this is really about. This is our Lord fulfilling prophecy, presenting himself to Israel as Israel's king. This is the son of of David, which is why the crowds recognizing that say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Now this morning, what I would like for us to consider from this passage is basically three things. That this is certainly Jesus' presentation to Israel as her king. And a second point that I think is necessary to, to bring out, because I mentioned earlier so many churches today believe that Jesus Christ is not reigning. He is not the ruler that he is meant to be or is going to be, that that's going to happen in the future. We need to see that even though Israel rejected Jesus, that he is in fact king. And then thirdly, we want to understand some of the applications of that for our lives today. If he is king, then that certainly means something. It means, among other things, that we need to listen to what he says and we need to submit to it. But we'll look at several applications. Well, first of all, let's consider that this is Jesus' presentation to Israel as her king. Listen to what Matthew tells us in Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5, something that Mark does not. He says that what, what we just read about took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. This basically was the fulfillment of many of the prophecies of the Old Testament all being wrapped into one, not the least of which the fulfillment of the blessing which Jacob, as he was dying, pronounced upon his sons, one son in particular, and that was Judah. This is what he said to Judah before he dies in Genesis 49, 10, and 11. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. Now basically what we have here is a prophecy looking forward many centuries before our Lord Jesus Christ enters into Jerusalem, predicting that this one son of Judah, and I hope you realize that David is of the tribe of Judah, and so the son of David is as well was going to be king, and this particular king would enter, as it were, on this donkey to present himself to the people, and this imagery of his robes being washed in the blood of grapes has to do with his coming crucifixion and the atonement that he was going to make for his people. This entrance into Jerusalem is the fulfillment of all these prophecies. And, and by the way, I should mention, certainly, that's one of the reasons at least one of the things that confirms to us that what we're reading in the Bible is not just something that a group of, of men decided to write throughout history. Wouldn't it be nice to make up these, these fairy tales and, and these legends, put them all together in a book and just you know, get people to believe this? We know this is more than just the writings of men because these things are predicted centuries before they happen. And they happen exactly as the Lord predicted that they would. Now, as I mentioned, this is Jesus' presentation uh, to Jerusalem, to Israel as her king. But certainly there are, well, there's more than one reason why he enters the way that he does. He does come as king, but he also comes to lay down his life. Again, the reference to washing his robes in the blood of grapes. The fact that he's riding upon this donkey is also pointing to this sacrifice, as well as to the fact that he's coming as king. Now, in biblical times, and especially in the Old Testament, men of war rode horses. 
But men of peace rode donkeys. The donkey was a symbol of peace. And our Lord Jesus Christ was coming to establish a kingdom. And actually, he was going to do it in a very peaceful way, wasn't he? It's going to be a kingdom of peace. And it's not going to be uh, spread by swords and, as it were, by warfare, at least not physical warfare. It's going to be spread by spiritual warfare, by declaring the message of peace. That's what the gospel is, how you can have peace with God. Lay down your weapons and submit to him. He is the king of peace. Now, it's interesting that Jews basically were told by the Lord not to have horses, but to have donkeys. And if you look in the Old Testament, you'll find that even you know, the kings and, and people who were riding to various places would always be using donkeys. And the reason was because God forbid them to have horses. He wanted them not to have that kind of powerful animal, but rather to have this this humble kind of animal. If you've ever seen somebody riding a donkey versus somebody riding a horse, there's a definite difference in how they appear, you know. Uh, the one looks rather humiliated. The other one looks, of course, uh, rather proud on his powerful mount. Well, again, there's a reason why God did things this way. It's because he didn't want his people to trust in the power of the horse. The horse was seen as a symbol of, of power, and it certainly was powerful in warfare. This is what the Lord said uh, through Moses in Deuteronomy as he was giving future commands for his people. He says, moreover, talking about the king, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He did not want them to have horses because he didn't want them to trust in the power of a horse. He wanted them to trust him for their deliverance. Again, listen to what the Lord says in Psalm 147. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He does not take pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord favors those who fear him, those who wait for his loving kindness. I think there's certainly a lesson here. One that our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us as he enters into Jerusalem with regard to humility and with regard to trust. And Jesus came to take up a kingdom, but he didn't come to do it by way of force of arms. Rather, it was by laying down his life. We'll see that as our Lord goes through the various stages of his suffering, that this means that he must place his trust in the Father. He doesn't put his trust in a horse. He doesn't put his trust in his disciples or in an army, but rather he trusts in the Lord. I, I really wanted to bring out this point because I think it's important for us as well. That we need to learn to trust the Lord. The problem is that in this society, in this world, we tend to trust so many things for our well-being. I mean, where is our security going to come from? The fact that tomorrow is going to be okay, the fact that our needs are going to be met. You know, to whom are we looking or to what? Are we looking to man? Are we looking to things? Are we looking to money? You know, the fact that we might have a good income, that we might have a healthy bank account, that we might have a good retirement stored up for us. Are you looking to your own strength in order to deal with the issues that you're going to have to face, the problems and difficulties? You know, with regard to your health, are you looking to your insurance policy? You know, it's funny thing is, uh, Bob Strimple, our seminary class, pointed out that in Canada, insurance is called assurance. You know, it's the idea that this assures you that things are going to be okay that you're going to get the treatment that you want. It's called assurance. It doesn't matter what kind of insurance it is. You know, the assurance that your family is going to be provided for if you die, you know, through life insurance or whatever it may be, health insurance and all these other types of assurance. Is your assurance coming from your policy, coming from your insurance? Is it coming from the government, your safety from the military or from the police? The fact is we're trained in this country to trust so many different things except the Lord. And that's where our trust needs to be. I mean, that's where Jesus was. He comes in unarmed amidst all these enemies 
that could at any time take him and put him to death, but his trust is absolutely upon the Lord. Listen to what the Lord says to his people through Jeremiah 17, verses 5 through 7. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord, for he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitants. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. Now again, I think the idea that our Lord Jesus Christ was coming in, riding on a donkey, reveals something of his trust in the Father's will. He doesn't come as a mighty conqueror with his trust in, in arms, the power of a horse, or the power of an army, but rather he trusts in his Father. And you know what? His will actually is accomplished in Jerusalem. God's will is fulfilled. Jesus does what he sets out to do because the Father is faithful. And if you put your trust in the Lord, you'll find that he is faithful too. He will never let you down. Now, I mentioned before that he's coming not just as a king, but he is also coming as a sacrifice. He will wash his robes in the blood of grapes. Maybe you've heard this before, but donkeys were also used as sacrificial animals in what's called the cutting of a covenant. Uh, in Near Eastern culture, whenever uh, two would make a covenant with one another, as we actually see in the case of, of Abraham, when God makes a covenant with him, although he doesn't in that instance use a donkey, you would take an animal or perhaps several animals and you would cut those animals in half, which sounds like a rather grotesque thing, but um, the, the shedding of blood, as you know, was very integral to covenants and what's called cutting a covenant. You would take those animals and obviously kill them, cut them in two, and then the two making the covenant would actually walk through the pieces as they make an agreement with one another. And the idea of the animal being divided is basically this, that you're, you're calling God to bear witness that if I do not keep the terms of the covenant that I have just made, may this happen to me. May I be cut in half. Well, our Lord Jesus Christ is coming to make a covenant. And basically that donkey was representative of the covenant that was going to be cut. Only in this case, it wasn't the donkey that was going to be cut. It was going to be our Lord Jesus Christ. The covenant had already been broken. We had already violated it. And everyone who would in the future put their trust in Jesus Christ, the curse was going to fall on him. And that's why he was not only going to be crucified, but why he was going to endure the wrath of God on the cross. Basically, that's all wrapped up in the imagery of the donkey too. There's a reason why Jesus rode the donkey, not just to fulfill prophecy, but because of these other reasons, to show his humility, to show his trust, and to show that he was coming <clears throat> to lay down his life in order to atone for the sins of his people. So Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. He arrives to present himself as king, as ruler, but he also comes in order to present himself as a sacrifice. So this was the day of his presentation. And we know from what's going to follow that Israel did not receive her king. As a matter of fact, Israel rejected him and crucified him. Now, does that mean that he didn't become king? Does that mean that his plan to be king was put on hold? Well, no. Israel rejected him. But that doesn't mean that he did not take that office. It doesn't mean that he's not ruling and reigning now. And again, the reason I bring that up is because I was reminded very um, strongly last week that, that there are those in the, uh, in the church, in the broad evangelical church, that do not believe that Jesus Christ is king. That's what I was taught when I went to the college that I went to. Again, dispensational thinking. It's been moving since I went to college. Maybe some of them have come out of this, but there are still many who are indoctrinated in this and believe that when Israel rejected Christ and crucified him, that God's plan for Israel was put on hold, that Jesus did not actually achieve or arrive at that throne of David, that he has not yet been coronated, 
And as a result, we're still looking forward to the king's coming to take up his rule. Well, the fact is, the Lord has fulfilled that promise. As a matter of fact, he's fulfilled all of his promises to Israel through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those things were not put on hold. Jesus actually fulfilled them. The Jews did not stop the coronation. Now, they certainly tried, but there was nothing that they could do. As a matter of fact, it was predicted in the Old Testament that they would try to stop him, but that the Lord would laugh at them and would install his king on Mount Zion nonetheless. I hope you uh, recognize the allusion there to Psalm 2, where the psalmist writes this. And again, this was quoted as fulfillment when Israel's leaders took their stand against the Lord, but they could not stop him. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I want you to notice that all these passages that I've been reading about Jesus Christ and his reign indicate that he has already taken it up. This looks forward to the fact that even though the kings would try to stop him, even though the leaders of Israel would try to stop him by handing him over to the Romans and crucifying him, yet he would still take up his reign. He would still be installed as king. As a matter of fact, Paul refers to his reign as having already begun. And he will reign until all his enemies are subdued under his feet. So he was rejected. He was crucified. But he was raised, and he ascended into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Listen to what the author of the Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 11 through 13. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. When did Jesus begin his reign? After he had laid down his life, making the sacrifice, by the way, the only sacrifice that can take away sins. Not those that the priests offer day by day, which cannot do it, but this once for all sacrifice. Once he made it, he was exalted to the right hand of God and he sat down until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. Right now he is ruling and he is reigning and he will continue to reign until all his enemies submit to him as we've already read in our meditation. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that's what it means. And again, that's what we read in Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. God highly exalted him, bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So is Jesus Christ King? He is the king of kings, which means he is the king over every king. He is the Lord of lords, which means that he is the Lord over every lord. And if he's the, the king of every king and the Lord of every lord, he's certainly the authority over you as well because he is the authority over your authority. He is king. He is ruling and reigning. Israel could not stop him. The Jews couldn't stop him. The Romans couldn't stop him. As a matter of fact, what they were doing was fulfilling what God had planned in order to bring him to the throne, in order that he might have a kingdom, and in order that the promise of the Father might be given to him, that all of his enemies will be subdued under his feet. Jesus is reigning now. It's not some future thing, but it's happening right now. 
and his enemies right now are being subdued under his feet. Now let's come to the third point. This was his presentation. He was rejected, but the Jews were not able to stop him. He is, in fact, king. What does that mean for you and for me? Well, first of all, the fact that he is king means that he is the authority over all, whether a, a believer or not. Whether you're a believer or not, he is still your authority. You know, for Christians, that's, of course, our blessedness. And that's what the Bible actually is referring to when it says, for instance, that Jesus is your Lord. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? I mean, he is your king, and he is your head. He's the head of the body. The head is that which directs the body. Uh, he is your husband. Uh, the authority structure that the Lord has set up in a family, the, the husband is the head. And what that means is he has authority, and I'm talking here now about, again, our Lord Jesus Christ, being Lord, being your head, being your husband. He is the authority, okay? And by the way, if you're not a believer, Jesus is your king as well. He is, as I've said before, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And of course, there are implications to that fact. Since he is our king, we are supposed to obey him. We must obey him. Now, oftentimes we, we say that, we think about that. Um, Jesus is king. Oh, yes, it's great that he's king. He's ruling and reigning. That means that the nations have to do what he says. He is our king, which means he is our protector and our provider, and he will protect and he will provide. The weird thing about it is, the sad thing about it is, we often think about his power to direct other nations and his ability to, to protect us and to provide for us, but we somehow seem not to, to make the connection between his authority as king and what it is that we're supposed to be doing because of that. You realize that because he is the king and because he is your king, he does have authority over you and the right to command you, the right to direct your life, the right to tell you what to do with all your life. You, your life, uh, my life, it doesn't belong to us. We don't have authority over it. The Lord Jesus Christ has authority over us. He has that by rights. And so he can tell us what to do. So what should we do on account of that? Well, how does the Lord speak? How does he tell you what he wants? Those are the places you need to go in order to find his will. He tells you in his word. He tells you through the preaching of his word. He even tells you, as we saw uh, this morning in that devotional on fellowship, from one another as we read the word and we see others uh, among us either doing or not doing what God calls us to do. We encourage and we admonish. These are all different ways that the Lord exercises his authority over us. So we need to learn from those things, particularly the commandments that are in the Bible, because that's where he expresses his his uh, direct will for our lives. Read those things and seek to submit to those things. Now that's what we do as believers. But the Lord, as I mentioned before, is also king over unbelievers. And what does he tell them to do? Well, he tells them that they need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in Psalm 2, we, we have that reference to what God expects of the world based on the fact that his son has been exalted as king in authority over the whole world. He says this, Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way for his wrath may soon be kindled how blessed are all who takes refuge or who take refuge in him. So what is, is everyone in the world supposed to do? Submit to him, take refuge in him. Submit to the gospel. I mean, what, what is the gospel? It's, it is good news, but it's a command too. 
that you are to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. You need to submit to that commandment. Paul says that one day every knee is going to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee is going to bow. Now, if you bow willingly, repenting and trusting in the Lord, this king will save you from your enemies, your greatest enemy being your sins. He will save you from that. He will take all your sins away, give you a perfect righteousness, and make you fit for heaven. But if you're unwilling to submit to him now and to bow the knee, you're still going to have to bow the knee someday. But on that day, it's going to be too late. You'll be lost. So the implications, of course, for authority is that we submit to authority. I think that's quite plain. And particularly if you're an unbeliever, you need to submit to the gospel. It's the only way of salvation. Now, thirdly, if the Lord is, in fact, king, then it is your responsibility and my responsibility to extend the rule of this king. I mean, that's, in essence, what, what his commandments really all have to do with. The Lord has conscripted you. You are his servants. You are the army of the Lord. You are the church militant. Your responsibility, your work, is to extend his kingdom, his rule, in every area that you have any influence over. That's what the Lord has commanded. The command that Jesus gave to his church, to his disciples, was not just for them, but it was for the church as a whole. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, when I read this passage, and I've read it several times before, do, do, do you connect? I mean, does it connect with you, or do you feel a kind of disconnect here? I mean, Jesus said this to his disciples. Was this just for them? Uh, Jesus says, make disciples of all the nations. Well, that's too great of a work for me. I, I, I can't do that, so I disconnect right there. Or this is the work of those he's raised up as missionaries or ministers, and it's not really my work, and so I get a disconnect there. Are you connected to this commandment? Does this commandment have to do with you? Is your king telling you that you have a part in this command, in fulfilling this commission? As a matter of fact, this is the work of his whole church, and we all have our part in it. And this is what the king calls us to do. By the way, the fact that many in the church today really feel that disconnect and don't see themselves as a part of this commission is one of the reasons why so little work is actually being done. I don't know if you get the Pira tweets. If you don't, you really should sign up for them because they're very, very useful. But I saw one recently that I thought was very appropriate. God has many servants, but little service. And that's the way it is. Again, we talked about the importance of service. If you're going to be great in God's kingdom, the one who serves the most and the one who suffers the most for his service is the one who actually is going to be honored the most. But you don't have to be a full-time employee of a church, a minister, an evangelist or whatever, a missionary to fulfill that. You can serve the Lord wherever you are, and that's what the Lord wants you to do. Do the very best you can in your work for his glory and, and let it be known to those you're working for and those you're serving that you are serving the Lord. Share the gospel with them as he gives you opportunity. Shine as lights in the world. That's how the kingdom of heaven extends. It's not by all of us quitting our jobs and going on to the missionary field or you know, just using all of our evenings to go out on the street and evangelize, although perhaps some of us could do that. We should be doing it everywhere we are. So again, as his army, this commandment, he is our king. We are his soldiers. This applies to us. And we need to be involved in this. We need to be laboring to advance his kingdom. And of course, there's many things that go into becoming effective soldiers in this army. We're going to be looking at one of the main things this evening. And that is if we're constantly being drawn out by the world 
and compromising with the world and letting the world take, take hold of our hearts and throw its cooling waters into our hearts, we're not going to have the zeal we need, the strength we need to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. We have to cut those influences off and use the means that God has given to us to stoke the flames within our hearts. We need to become skillful in using the sword of the Spirit that the Lord has given to us. We need to become mighty in prayer. We need to become like Jesus Christ, and that's what putting off our sins and putting on Jesus Christ is all about. Stop being like the world. Stop seeking to be the next, you know, as it were, you know, America's got talent, Britain's got talent, uh, American idol, or whatever it may be. You know, put that stuff aside and begin to become like Jesus. That's what putting off sin and putting on Christ is all about. You've got to grow. And then, again, don't be afraid to shine your light in the world. The Lord calls us to live as lights. Don't hide your light under a bushel but put it on a lampstand so that everyone can see. That happens by making godly choices, by holding your ground against things you know are evil, that you're not going to do that, by making choices that other people see and see you doing things and hear you speaking things that have to do with the Lord and his truth. That's how you shine as a light in the world. And you need to pursue this, of course, at the foundational level, by seeking the Lord, by praying, as the Bible says, without ceasing, praying privately, praying with your family, praying corporately when the church meets together to pray, by fasting, if you are able to fast. Now, not everybody can, but those who can, that's what you ought to be doing. Uh, beginning this uh, Friday on, at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a fast. The elders have called for a fast. Our Lord Jesus is telling us in his word that that's what he wants us to do. So let me ask you this question. Are you fasting? Are you going to fast on that day? If you're able to do it, the Lord requires that of you. If you're able, if it threatens your health, don't do it. But if you're able to do it, do it. Now, we're also going to meet to pray on Saturday. Are you planning on being at that prayer meeting? Is your, your schedule providentially open? And are you able to be there? If so, your king tells you that's what he wants you to do, to be there and to pray. Sometimes, again, I think there's another disconnect um, between what we read in the Bible and reality. You know, we don't see Jerusalem. We don't see uh, these various things happening in front of us. And sometimes we tend to think that those things aren't real or they may not be real. Well, that's, that's where faith comes in, doesn't it? Faith is able to see the unseen. And it's able to take God at his word and to know that what we read in the Bible is real. That Jesus is real. That his kingdom is real that the day of judgment is real and it's going to come someday. The new heavens and the new earth are real. Do you believe that these things are real? And are you living as though they are real? Jesus is king and he's king, he's a real king over a real kingdom and that kingdom exists, it exists in your hearts. We are the kingdom of the Lord and God wants that kingdom to expand. We need to wake up to this and take these things seriously because the Lord takes these things seriously. We need to take up the weapons of his warfare, which are spiritual weapons, because there is a real spiritual war going on. It's going on in your hearts every day. I mean, it's the reason why we, we either do more or don't do more, depending upon how well we fight this battle within our own hearts. If you don't see that there's a battle going on, if you don't feel that, and if you're not waging that battle, first to overcome your own sins so you can get out to do what the Lord calls you to do, then you're already a casualty of that battle. The people who don't see that there's a battle going on, they're the ones that, that are basically already taken captive by the enemy. This battle exists. 
and your king calls you to fight for him. He wills you to expand his kingdom. The Lord says, work for me. Witness for me. Pray and seek me that I might expand that kingdom. He says, fast and pray if that's what you're able to do. And he also promises that if you do that, not only will you not be quenching the spirit of God, but you'll gain blessing in this life. You'll gain blessing and reward in the world which is to come. You'll not only have the honor of, of standing in the place of your Lord and doing his work and will, either experiencing persecution or perhaps victory, whatever it may be, whatever it is he wills. You'll have that pleasure and honor of experiencing it in his place. And that's a great blessing. Greater fullness of the spirit, but again, the Lord has promised a greater reward if you will. Now again, we're reminded in, in 1 Corinthians 3 that on the day of judgment, there's, there's going to be our, our life is going to be represented as this building that we've built, this structure which is going to be made up of various things. And the Lord says that a fire is going to be put to it. And everything that is worthless is going to be burned up and gone. And everything that we have done that has some value is going to remain. Now the question is, what is your building? What is your structure? What is your life? going to look like on the day of judgment? Is it going to be a, a building of wood, straw, and stubble? Is it all going to go up in flames because you weren't willing to engage in the battle? You weren't willing to submit to the king and you couldn't overcome your sins and your struggles with the world? Or is it going to be an, a, an edifice of solid gold and, and gems and so forth that don't get burned up in the fire? that is going to result in a reward for you that you're going to receive throughout all eternity. You realize that how you use your lives, the time you have now, is determining the quality of that particular structure. What do you want your building to look like on that day? What do you want the fire to consume on that day? What do you want to, to remain? The degree to which you're able to overcome the influences of the world, the sins in your heart, and to engage in what the Lord calls you to do, the more that edifice is going to be filled with things that are going to remain. We need to remember that time is short. And you know how it is, uh, procrastination, that's where you're always putting off things for the future. And we're all guilty of it. But these are things we can't afford to procrastinate in. We need to just get in there and submit to the Lord and do what he tells us to do. We'll find that any difficulties or struggles or issues we're dealing with, spiritual battles, we're going to gain the strength to overcome them if we do this. And we're going to live much better lives for the glory of the Lord. Sometimes we think we don't have the strength to engage in it, but have you ever considered that maybe the strength comes from getting involved in it, overcoming the things again that may be really sapping your strength, which could be the sins, our compromise, our procrastination. Jesus Christ is king, and we need to submit to our king because what he's telling us to do is not only good for him and his kingdom, but it is best for you and for me. We're the ones that benefit most from serving the Lord. So again, they may have rejected Jesus Christ, but he is still king, and he is your king, and he's my king, and we need to listen to what he tells us to do. Let's especially listen to what he calls us to do with regard to how he is, well, told us day of fasting and prayer is coming. Let's purpose to engage in that. And as much as possible, if we're able to do it, let's not do it just privately, but let's come together corporately. And let's seek the Lord for his mercy and blessing. This is what your king wills you to do. Again, if he's providentially given you the opportunity and the strength, the health to do it, that's what he wants you to do in your service to him. And from there, we'll see what the Lord will do. But let's keep seeking him and let's keep seeking to extend his kingdom. Let's continue to live for him and to, um, to seek to glorify him. But realize again that prayer is, is so foundational. And when you fast, it really adds power to prayer. 
And it's going to make a great difference if we actually trust the Lord and engage in it. He will use it for his glory. He will answer. He will send the blessing. But we do have to submit. We have to do his will. So may the Lord grant us the grace to do that, to submit to him, to obey him for our good. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply that word to our hearts and let's also uh, particularly do that as we uh, are looking forward to the Lord's table. Spend a few moments in prayer.